Good morning, everyone. I hope you kind of woke up the body a tiny bit. <coughs> um, we'll continue to work with the body. So um, if you check in the program at 5 p.m., it's mentioned mindfulness meditation, but it's really something I don't like to be called as um, the thing I do. It's more bodyfulness meditation, if anything, and soon you'll discover why. Um, so my name is Dan Joy. Um, I don't think it's too important to know too much about me for what we're going to do. Initially, I wanted to be a Protestant priest, so I studied um, theology and philosophy. Then with a slight change, I went to work for Citibank and became an organizational development supervisor. So I spent 10 years in the corporate world, working as a trainer, coach, and mediator, financial consultant. And then um, I ended up working for an ethical bank which was the kind of um, everything seemed to be fine and make sense. <coughs> but then, as I fall in love with my life, with my wife, <laughs> again, <coughs> <laughs> it starts like this, but actually it ends really well. Um, so I moved to the UK, and then I just completely started off a new life, and I became a Lomi Lomi practitioner and teacher. So I do body work these days, and I teach body works, and I completely fall in love with the body <laughs> and tactile therapy. So that's, that's my thing, if you want. And um, I help people feel home in their bodies. That's, that's my talent. There is probably no other way how life could use me more or better, and also in a way which I enjoy, like genuinely <coughs> enjoy. Um, so what we're going to do is a very simple Thank you. Yeah, so just to get over the whole sales pitch, I wrote a book about what I'm going to talk now. So if you want to buy it, then it's going to be available here also at the um, info tent. Um, so I started off with Vipassana meditation probably around 20 years ago. I've been on and off with all kind of meditation practices, mindfulness practices, and uh, pretty much there was nothing ever in my life I could stick long term or anything I could really practice as a daily practice uh, for long term after, you know, the Vipassana retreats as it's, as it's, as it's part of the whole kind of um, approach and probably many of you have been through that. There is often a three month or six month period when you really do it every morning and really do it every evening and then just somehow it just fades away. Um, the thing I'm doing now is so simple that you can either do it until the end of your life, at least I really, really wish that you, you do it, and then you can do it for five seconds or ten seconds. And um, I will tell you the 45 seconds or the one minute version um, very soon. If your um, mind or first reaction is like, oh, okay, we got it, then, uh, then probably I lost you. So um, the thing is um, very simply put, again, the 45 seconds version is that you can teach yourself to be reminded to be present by your own breathing. So it's not like all the pranayama practices where you focus on the breathing. But it's a step before that, using the breath to remind you to be present. So very simply put, when I'm breathing in, I remind myself to be here. When I breathe out, I remind myself to be now. And I glue together the two things, the breathing in and here, the breathing out and now. So probably many of you know about the Pavlovian reflex, if you heard it when, when you studied biology in elementary school, that there were these dogs who always had this bell ringing when they got food, and then after a while, even if they just kind of got the, the bell ringing, still their saliva started to run as if it, they would have had the food even though they didn't have it. So we can do the same kind of thing. We can glue together something, and it's used in NLP or Silva method or I don't know, whatever you know, is, is familiar for you. So every single time when we learn a new practice or a new habit, then we can do it in various ways. And it seems that we human learn the easiest if we take an existing habit and then we glue it together with the new one, and then it somehow goes easier than just from scratch or from out of the blue trying to learn something. So in this case, the stupidly simple realization is that we can use our very own breathing as a reminder to be present. So it's like a, a Google reminder that is in your own body that is going to work until the end of your life. So literally, until the last breath you have in this life, there will be an impulse in your life that will remind you to be present basically every five seconds. Depending on how fast or slow you, you breathe, 
your breath is going to kind of knock on your door every three to six, eight seconds, asking you, hey, where are you now? Are you maybe stuck in your head or in a story lost in the mind? Or um, could you maybe just be in the body? And it's going to repeat, repeat itself five seconds later and then five seconds later, and then five seconds later. So if you kind of teach yourself this new habit, it's really like a, a very simple, plain, mundane conditioning of a new habit in your life, then instead of being lost in your mind, which we, I guess, all have an experience of, the c then you can just gradually teach yourself that the default mode, how you live your life, is being present in your body. It's really as simple as that. And um, so this is... I guess the revolutionary part of the, the whole thing, the second part is very simple, which is taught in, I guess, all sort of um, embodiment practices, is being in the body. So it's one thing to be reminded by something. So we quite often are reminded maybe by a teacher or a friend, or just suddenly we have this thought appearing in our awareness like, oh, oh gosh, you know, like I'm in a story, I could maybe just be in the body. So this is the thing that we are deliberately aiming to trigger in ourselves by the breathing, that this aha moment, that this realization that actually I'm lost in my mind would be easier. So we have like a safety net, if you want, which is your very own breathing that is happening eight or ten times every minute that will just all the time tell you like, hey, are you necessarily in your mind or maybe it's just completely pointless. So this is the first part. I will, oh sorry, I forgot to tell you like what we're going to do. <coughs> so. <laughs> I'm doing this thing like telling you what the practice is, then we're going to practice it together. So I will kind of guide you through and then we're going to have a Q&A. And then uh, we'll see, I guess now we have a tiny bit shorter time than an hour, but um, maybe we go back into the practice. Um, so I promise that I won't talk that much. I will finish in a few, <laughs> few, few minutes and then we go into the practice and then we're going to have a Q&A. Um, so the first part of the whole practice is, that um, you have this inbuilt reminder to be present, which is your very own breathing. So breathing in is here, breathing out is now. And the funny thing is that even though the, this little lecture here um, is maybe less than 40 minutes or 45 minutes, it doesn't have to stop. You don't have to stop this ever, and I don't. I've been doing this for three years, and as I said, I had that, like all sort of kind of meditation practices and mindfulness practices, but this is the first thing in my life that I just, it's so stupidly simple that I just do it all the time, which adds up actually this uh, wishful or imaginary thinking several hours that we all heard, you know, like probably any, any of the meditation camps or, or retreats you went, that actually we have so many time every day when we could use, you know, the time for meditation. And it's true. It's just really true. We just don't have a reminder that would tell you every single time when this time and space is there to, to really do it. Well, now there is one, which is your breathing. So um, once I finish the lecture here and I start to walk from here to the info tent, I'm doing it. Or when I put petrol into my car for that 40 seconds, I do it. I'm sitting on the toilet, I do it. Simply because in all these moments, it's absolutely pointless to be in the mind, really. I'm doing something and whatever I'm thinking, actually the more abstract it is, the, the more certain I can be that it's pointless to think about. So these big questions about life, enlightenment and death and all these kind of things, as soon as I know that there is something abstract going on while I'm sitting on the toilet having a shower or doing the dishes, no question that it's pointless. I can drop it and then here is the second part. So the reminder is the breathing, your inbuilt Google reminder until the end of your life is your very own breathing, breathing in here everything out now. So that's the kind of trigger to get out of the mind. And then, so the second part of this practice is to find out where is your focus. So it's one thing to kind of, well, I guess we, we all have this thing like, oh gosh, you know, I was lost in this thing for like minutes, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a, I don't know, traffic jam maybe. And then suddenly you, you realize that it's been minute that you have a dialogue with someone who died 10 years ago and it's just completely nonsense. <laughs> And you pay attention to it, and you continue. You don't like it. You just have new facets and colors and spices for the whole thing. And it can be the future, the past. So I guess you all have experiences of that. Um, so it's one thing that you kind of wake up from this dreamy state or sometimes nightmare or anxiousness. But what do you do then afterwards? So where do you place your focus? That's the, the next tricky question. And so in my, my experience or, or in this practice, we just simply place it in the body. 
So again, breath work is such a cliche. We so often refer to this thing like, oh, focus on your breathing. Oh, right, but where? How? What, what do we really mean when we say focus on your breathing? So there are yogis and yoginis who are so sharp, so fine with their awareness and, and attention, then they can really focus on their um, breathing, let's say, really going into the lung and the cells, and they can really feel it. I can't. Most ordinary people, I think we can't, but you can learn it. In my kind of practice, the very simple thing is to go as long as you have a felt sense, a body sensation, like a, a feeling which is just like a completely ordinary human feeling, everybody can feel that. So once we go into the uh, short practice we're going to do in a few minutes, I will guide your attention to find a felt sensation, so a body sensation that is real, that is not hallucination, fantasy. So we're going to be looking for really, really simple stuff, like let's say I have this belt which goes a little bit into my tummy as I'm breathing out, or the t-shirt, or we're looking for that kind of stuff. We're not looking for the big abstract magic somewhere. We're just looking for something that you can really feel and that every single human being can feel who has got skin. Most of us, we got skin, so it shouldn't be that, that difficult. And then you can change, so obviously you can go deeper or you can change the focuses. But initially, that's the two steps, or that's the only thing we aim for. There is my breathing. Obviously, I can be reminded to be present from like plenty of other stuff um, and other people. And so it is, oh gosh, you know, I was again lost in my mind. So this can come from anything. What I'm teaching here is just simply there is plus one method, your breathing built in, happening several times in a minute, that it will just always tell you like, hey, are you here? Are you here? Are you here? And then sometimes, just maybe yeah, kind of sparing the time for the Q&A, sometimes it's useful to be in the mind. So I'm not an enemy of thoughts, enemy of the mind. No, 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 no. It's all fine. So when you are in problem resolution, you are sitting in front of your laptop and you are sending an email to someone or you kind of screwed up a figure in an Excel spreadsheet, it's very useful to pay attention to your mind. You are in problem resolution mode. It would be quite silly to, in the middle of this, just suddenly drop the whole thing and then, you know, it won't get done, you know? No, yeah, you, you gotta be there, you gotta do it, you gotta follow through the theater. Same thing, you know, if you, I don't know, lost somewhere and uh, you took a right or wrong turn, you know, um, when you were following the satna, let's say coming here, you screwed it up. Yeah, yeah, then you just pay attention to the mind, the thinking and the whole problem resolution process is useful. And of course, sometimes it, it is actually, we, we, we love, but sometimes it makes sense to, step back, take a few breaths, and to realize, oh gosh, you know, like I'm so, you know, like struggling with this thing, maybe I just need a bit more space, and then I go back again. Anyway, so what I'm saying is, it's freedom. So we'll, we'll come back to that, but it's freedom what we're learning here or practicing here. So first part of the practice is, now, now you know that there is this thing, breathing, and basically, if you want, you can use it until the end of your life to be a trustworthy, really good friend, reminding you all the time, several times in a minute, to be here and to be now, to be here and to be now, to be here and to be now. And the second step is that you drop your attention into your body, and this is something that makes more sense to, to practice, so we're going to go into a little guided bodyfulness practice or meditation if you want. And then, um, yeah, I will give you like a few kind of templates or examples. What are the type of sensations, what we do? Um, and then, yeah, to conclude, that's basically it. So what I'm teaching myself and what I'm teaching you is that we have the freedom of choice, which we quite often don't. We are so habituated, so deeply conditioned, and this culture is not really helping you know, to, the, to do the opposite, to pay attention to the mind, to the thinking mind, that we have this thing that we are stuck. Like, Collectively, we are stuck. We are just paying attention all the time to the mind, which, as I said, sometimes is really useful. We do amazing things. We di design buildings and we do really cool stuff with our mind. And also, we have very inspiring thoughts. We write books and stuff like that. It's fine. We just had this bad habit to pay attention to the mind also when it's completely unnecessary. It's just rubbish. And so what, what we learn here, or what is this method about, or practice, or whatever you call it, is just to gain more freedom to not to pay attention to the mind all the time. And then I have more choice, more space to pay attention when I have to, and not to pay attention when I don't need to. The more you disrupt the unnecessary kind of s stream of thoughts, the easier it becomes to do it the next time, and then the next time, and then the next time, and then you can just be in your body. You can literally spend every single day, hours, just breathing in and out and being in your body. 
I'm, I'm not kidding. It really adds up. So this uh, kind of legend about how you can use little moments for being present. Yeah, yeah, you can really do that. And it's so pointless. Then the mind will absolutely come up with all sort of things like how to make this better or what else to do. But actually, if you kind of succumb to the simplicity of this, and I'm not promising like any, anything more than that. The only thing that will happen that you're just going to spend hours every single day breathing in and out and being in your body. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, there's no no big <laughs> promise. <laughs> All right, so let's do a, a little practice. And um, as this is a thing that you do in your life, you can do uh, with your eyes closed, or you can just fix a point. Again, we learn something that goes beyond uh, the meditation cushion or uh, or the yoga mat. This is something that you're gonna hopefully do like all the time in your life so there's no need to kind of fix yourself into a position where you can't move because in life you're gonna move so now it's it's easier it's gonna be easier because we are static but um yeah what we're learning is something that i really wish you would take with yourself for your basically whole life so um yeah you can have your eyes closed and also open And we'll start with this very simple instruction of becoming aware of your breathing. Soon we'll find a, a focus where and how we do that. But for now, just become aware of your breathing. And um, again, in the spirit of freedom, don't try to do anything with your breathing. So again, we are creating a space in one way for yourself, for your body, even for your mind, just to be as they are. So if your breathing is shallow, just let it be shallow. You don't need to do diaphragmatical breathing or long extended exhalations or pranayama practices. We just simply become aware of the breathing however it is. And just realize that this thing that you're noticing now is your best friend. It's happening pretty much all the time, the way how it's happening now. And there are situations where we run or make love or dance when this whole rhythm is faster or, or different. But most of the time, this gentle contraction and extraction is just the rhythm that will follow you and potentially guide you until you live. So now let's have a short exploration of three locations where you can focus your attention. So what we do, we have our breathing best friend knocking on the door, asking us, hey, how are you? Then we might realize that, well, we are in the body, present, so then we just smile and enjoy. Or if it's sadness, then we just embrace. And if we are stuck in the mind, we say, oh, thank you. So instead, let me just drop into the body. So one location where we could drop into the body and focus our attention on the breathing to have a real felt sensation is around the nose. So this is where we can start our exploration. This is probably the hardest, or at least for me, because that's where the breathing happens in the subtlest version from a point of view of noticing or observation. So it's a really, really tiny sensation as the air is leaving the body and then how the air is coming in. If you're really subtle, then you can feel that the air going out is most of the time a bit warmer than the air coming in. The bonus of this location is that it has got a sound. So for, for some of us, the nose is in a shape or form that there is a slight, tiny little sound as we breathe in and out, and that can be the reminder as well.
yeah, in my nose now there is this tiny little tingling sensation as well. It's a kind of bonus. Now let's see our second location, which is the chest. So the upper part of the upper body. So what I feel here usually, and you might feel something similar, is potentially the t-shirt or jumper, kind of cutting a tiny bit under my armpit as I'm breathing in, and then this sensation fading away as I breathe out. There's also some of my chest muscles. Just somehow, they just seem to feel a bit denser as I breathe in and they are stretched and then this sensation again dissipates as I exhale and they relax. And now apparently with this chair there is a tiny, tiny pressure in my back as well as I'm breathing in and out. So you might find other body sensations. The important thing is that we are looking for this kind of stuff. We, we don't suffice with anything else but body sensations, feelings or felt sensations that make sure that we are not imagining to focus on the breathing but we have a tangible experience of it really happening in the body. And then let's drop to the third classic location, which is the tummy and abdominal area. So see what you find here. Yeah, for me, what one of these classic is the, the belt of my trouser, or, or if you have a, an elastic in it, then it can press it against your tummy in a way that when you breathe in, the sensation there is a bit stronger. Yeah, I can feel my back against the chair, probably it's not available for you. Also my tummy somehow presses against my rib cage a little bit. So whatever we find, make sure that it's real. It's a body sensation, you're not making it up, you're not hallucinating. This is the type of simple thing we're looking for. And you don't need to do yoga for that or any kind of practice. It's enough to have a skin, muscles, bones, and pay attention. So now listen closely to the instructions I'm giving because we are going to finish the guided practice part of this session, but you don't need to stop what you're doing now to pay attention to me with your eyes open. So as I said, this is not a practice you need to do 10 minutes in the morning or an hour in the evening, or of course you can do it, 
but just there is no point for stopping it. You can connect to life, you can connect to other people through being present in your body. So now when I ask you to open your eyes or pay attention to me, actually you don't need to open your eyes if you don't want to, then um, you can just stay in your body, please do. Just stay in your body and have the focus of your attention somewhere where you can really feel the breathing happening. And just as it is true for our eyesight, having the focus of your attention in the body, it doesn't mean that you're going to be blind for the rest of the world, no. So if we focus somewhere our eyesight, with our peripheric view, we still see plenty of stuff. So what I'm asking is just stay in your body and then you can still listen to me, ask questions, you can walk. So you don't need to stop this. You can stay present in your body and live your life. And whenever you get lost in your mind, you have your breathing telling you every five, ten seconds, hey, brother, sister, maybe you could come back. And then you will see. Maybe it's something useful that, that's happening in the mind, so then you pay attention, you resolve a problem, or you guide a therapy session. But if it's not necessary, it's just rubbish from the past or anxiety regarding the future, then you just disrupt this conditioning of paying attention to the mind and drop your attention into the body. And you stay there as long as you can. <laughs> if you're lucky, it might be even minutes before you get lost in the mind again. Normally, it won't take more than 10 or 20 seconds and you're going to be back in your mind. But fine, because five seconds later, again, you have an exhalation or inhalation, which will say, hey, you can come back again. So initially, it's just going to be hundreds of times disrupting this conditioning of paying attention to the mind, coming back to the body, and then it will just become a new habit. Really, this is that simple. And so now if you have anything to feedback or ask, then please do. Yeah, I would be very happy to hear feedback as well, not just questions, but anything is welcome. So, Q&A. All right. Okay. So half of humanity is saved. So, <coughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, bra. Yeah. Whatever it is. As soon as we have a felt sensation, so really a body sensation, we can be sure that that's something that is in the here and now. Pretty much anything else can be hallucination, but these type of little things, they can't really happen in the past or in the future. These type of things are quite reliably happening in the present moment. So as long as I'm focusing and anchoring my attention on them, I'm focusing on something that is happening now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I got him. Well, first of all, all my compassion. I don't have it like standard, but uh, I kind of know the feeling because sometimes it comes and go for me as well. For me, it's more just when I ti I'm tired and then it's just on and I, yeah, I can't turn it off. Um, I would say that um, obviously there are so many beautiful things I could tell you um, how this practice can evolve in your life, how the notion of here and now just kind of go out the window and are not necessary and so forth. But one of the things I discovered was that what I'm lately entering with this practice is that I'm just becoming this simple motion. I will show you because I don't know what to call it this. And this is happening pretty much like all the time. So if I'm not running or doing something really urgent, if I focus on my body, this is what I find. And then I'm just becoming this. It's a really peaceful, beautiful thing to 
be aware of or to become or whatever you call it. And it's not exactly the body. So initially I was pretty much like I'm teaching now, very strictly focusing on stuff that I know that in it's not like some sort of a fantasy that I'm focusing on my breathing, but actually I'm just lost and spaced out or no, no, no. Very like precise things. But this is how, like at this stage at least, it's kind of guiding me. So I would say that um, maybe experiment with this because this is not exactly the body or the body sensations. I couldn't really describe it what it is, but this gentle pulsation, this is, well, I, mean, I don't know really how to like <laughs> verbally put it, but this is what I'm becoming most of the time when I'm, when I'm doing the practice. And then maybe it's a little bit further away from the, the tinnitus and the center of the body, but still it's a bodily sensation to becoming this kind of pulsation. And whatever thoughts would arise in this kind of fluctuation, I just know that it's pointless. I drop it and I come back into this. Okay, any questions or feedback? Yes. Sorry, can you speak up or can you give her a microphone? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was how and what to do if someone has got physical pain in the body. And, uh, well, first of all, again, all my compassion. So I have people around in my life, um, in my family, that I just know that really this is a bad advice to give, like, please focus on your body and be in your body because it's not a place they like to be. It's very painful. So then I just um, tell them the same thing as I said earlier. Come as close as you can to the body, but still not maybe exactly or in the depth of the body, because what you find there is pain. And even though it is possible to stay with the pain, or there is something beyond the pain, but depending on someone's like energy stocks, or patience, or endurance, this might just be an advice that is just lacking compassion. <coughs> so I would say, just as it is true for, let's say, any kind of meditation practice, sometimes it's just not a good thing to do. Someone being in deep depression and asking them to wonder about the mind, it's contraindicated. So, yeah, I would say compassion is a good, good guide how to practice this for yourself and also how to give advice about this to anybody else. Thank you for the question. <coughs> Any other questions or feedback? And could you please help me how much time we got? And when, when it's, this is finishing, sorry? And it's 36 now? Uh, sorry? Sorry, I couldn't hear it. I just said you can change us to dance. To dance? <laughs> you have half an hour left. Ah, uh, do I? Or I think it's over, no? So it was a one and a half hours or? All right, okay, amazing. Cool. So we got more time to be in the body. Yeah, so, um, yeah, as I said, well, it's, it's quite funny because intuitively I said that we might do a Q&A and then we go back into the practice. So I would say, like, yeah, let's go back into the practice. So nothing wrong will happen. We're just going to spend more time in the body and breathe in and out. And then we can, so I would say that if you engage with the practice, one of the kind of resistance of the mind will be that this is just so pointless. <laughs> and it is, really. So especially if you come from a non-dualistic background, this is not going to lead you anywhere, honestly. I mean, I don't know, maybe later on, yes, but after three years, the only thing that is happening, I just spend more time in my body, consciously breathing in and out, and that's it. So, um, yeah, I would say, let's go back into the practice, we we'll do a little bit more, and then we can come back to the Q&A, and yeah, sorry about the confusion regarding the time. Um, yes. Sorry, I can't. 
Sure. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and anybody who wants to leave, just feel free um, during the practice or after the practice. And again, you don't have to stop. So wherever you go, whatever you're going to do, it's just always a cool thing to be in your body and being aware of your breathing. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes, the question. Yeah. Yeah, so she's wondering what other changes I observe or notice um, in my life. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question because um, I guess the, the question itself and also the answer what I would have given you, let's say, three years ago, two years ago, and now, and probably five years from now, is just constantly changing. Um, <coughs> I'm really quite cautious about any kind of promise, you know, like, oh, what's this going to do? Because um, it depends on where the question is coming from. So again, from a non-dualistic point of view, even this whole thing is like laughable. It's like, why would you do this? Or what's, what's the tricky hope, you know, like you, you're trying to get there, or maybe you want to get enlightened, da, 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 da. you can't do anything like that, you can't do anything. So m probably most of you know this kind of thread. And so thankfully, from that point of view, this is really harmless because uh, every single time when you do the practice, even if you ha would have any naughty thoughts about how you would like to get enlightened or liberation, well, it's just thoughts. So the next breath will tell you to come back to the body. So whatever, you know, fancy kind of temptations you had about anything like that, you just come back to the body, breathe, and you're in the body here and now, and that's it. End of story. Um, so from that perspective, nothing will happen. Um, what I do notice is I would say probably it's freedom, I would say, or spaciousness around everything or things. So in one way, I guess um, this is not replacing any kind of therapy, shadow work, or it's not like a magic pill you can swallow and then just anything you know that was problematic in your life will resolve. No, they won't. You still have to kind of work on it. but. It certainly gives you more freedom and spaciousness to do any of that kind of work. And also, just in general, I guess the, the reactivity of the mind is just gener gently, but I would really say gently, I have a really noisy mind, it's just, just gently kind of changing. And I would say it's really important to, to realize that um, we have this, again, kind of cliche in the spiritual um, field of quieting the mind or um, having a still mind and, and all these kind of um, goals or endeavors. I absolutely stop that. I don't aim for that. I think it's um, in this culture, it's almost like compassionless to encourage people to do that because it's so difficult. So if you go into a monastery in, um, I don't know, anywhere on the planet actually, where there is a supportive energy, a community, and a quiet place, I mean a literally quiet place, and you can meditate six hours a day, then you can quiet your mind. Maybe it takes like, let's say, five or ten years, but you can really have a mind where you just walk around in nature and for, for minutes or for hours, there's no thoughts appearing. You can really do that. But in this culture, where everything is about stimulation, like literally, well, I mean, if you're lucky, you know, we, we have people like Eckhart Tolle who just and, and some others who, who really got this beautiful gift or this grace that they just have this quiet mind. Or if you really practice, like if you get up every day, let's say four and before going to work until seven, you have a three hour meditation session. If you regularly do that, which would co somehow counterbalance the thing that is happening outside of your meditation practice, then you can really quiet your mind. But this is not like a hundred percently supportive kind of surroundings, I would say. But the good news is, and the good news with this practice, what you can do is to withdraw your attention from your mind. That's easy. That you can do it like several times a minute. It's like going into a spiritual gym where your new, new toy is to do this thing that the thoughts are going on and suddenly in the middle of the movie or the story, you just withdraw your attention and you start to watch your kind of belly going up and down or your chest where you have a body sensation. 
And of course, the stories are created in a way that within a few seconds, it's just so exciting that you go back and you watch again, you do the dialogue or you have the angry whatever fight with someone. But it's fine. In a few seconds, there's the next, uh, next, next breathing telling you like, oh, is it necessary? Oh, no, actually not. Yeah, okay, let's come back here. And so this disruption of the conditioning as you do it more and more and more becomes easier and easier and easier. So even though I did let go of this huge endeavor of trying to steal the mind, I do have a busy mind. Laura's here, my partner, she knows, like it's just utterly noisy and annoying sometimes. Um, but I do experience how it's becoming more and more easy to realize that it's not necessary to pay attention to what's going into my mind. So in one way, I'm becoming Yeah, it sounds funny, but I started to love my mind more and more, really. With the body, it's somehow easier to kind of think of it like a good friend. We take care of it, we do yoga, we eat healthily, and all that stuff. But I guess I just started to have this thing with my mind, which initially was just this annoying thing. I can never stop. It just goes on and on and on and on. And sometimes I have the blessing of having some inspiring thoughts. Then I write books or give lectures or whatever. But I would say most of the time, still, my mind, you know, sorry, but, you know, like, <laughs> it just doesn't work to pay attention to. But, but I started to still love it, nevertheless. I just started to accept it that it's just what it does. In one way, I was guilty because in the past few decades, I was training it to do this, or I was part of this whole thing, how it happened to be the way, how it is. But then now there is more and more acceptance of what's happening there, knowing that I don't need to stop it. It's just enough to withdraw my attention. I can decide about that. I can't really decide at this point, you know, to stop my mind. Uh, it just goes on. But it's fine. Let's just, you know, it's like my heart. I, I don't need to do anything with it. It's just happening. So then I just withdraw my attention, drop into the body. As I'm, and as I'm experiencing this, the, the mind just maybe goes on and on and it doesn't stop. So I would say if, you know, there is anything I can kind of... Um, notice like what changes in my life that this whole process of withdrawing my attention becomes easier there is more space and there is more freedom to to choose to not to pay attention to the mind and just to be in the body so in a way yeah i guess there's more enjoyment of life or or, or opening up something yeah, yeah like that to to be present so in one way yeah i mean especially if you ask people who, who know me i i have quite a bunch of my stupid uh um, patterns or, or bad habits or, you know, you know it. But um, I'm more and more just present in, in the body. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, any other questions before we kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because um. you might, you know, you think, you keep overthinking. I'm not sure I got the question right, so... Well, like, you know, you're overthinking, um... Maybe talk to them into oh. the microphone. Yeah, so it's like overthinking things. Mm hmm So, like, you're repeating it in your head. Yeah. Like, trying to work out what to do, sort of thing. Yeah. With something. Um, so, you, you're aware it's you, you're overthinking. You're yeah. aware of it. Yep. Yeah. And you get fed up yourself. You think, oh, for God's sake go and do something but which is what I do so I digress with something else but I guess just doing the breathing would help yes yes and I think that the only thing I could I mean in one way my my answer won't be anything like big news here the only thing I would kind of point out in in your question is that um, and maybe it relates to the previous questions a tiny bit as well that I, I have less and less this thing being fed up with my mind so it's simply like, you know, the day goes, it's getting dark, and then there is this moment when it just gets so dark that you turn on the light in the room. You don't get fed up with the darkness. No, it just came to the point when it's better to turn up the light and then you see better. That's it. So this whole thing that's happening inside is, is not about, you know, being frustrated with the mind or being fed up. No, I just simply realize that I pay attention to something that I don't need to pay attention so I disrupt the whole conditioning, I drop to the body, and then I'm here. And then I'm just... Mm, 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 mm. And then maybe 10 seconds later, I'm going back. 
but it's just the same thing. I just know that my mind does this, captures my attention. There's nothing wrong. It just does what uh, you know it's been conditioned to to do in the last I don't know 47 years, and then it's not my mind's fault. So I just disrupt again the conditioning, drop the attention to the body, and I'm there until I'm either kind of tempted or um, kind of wandering away in the mind, or just very naturally there is a conversation happening or I need to do something where it makes sense to pay attention to the mind. And then, you know, this whole cliche about how the mind is a, a useful tool becomes a reality because really I just cooperate with my mind, I pay attention to it, and then it helps me to do things or figure out stuff or even planning stuff about the future. So there are moments when it's just very helpful or, or useful, but then I'm becoming like more unsharp to kind of grab the moment when it's no longer necessary. We just kind of stuck on the same thing of thinking, but oh no, no, no! Well, now we are thinking about something that's just pointless. So then I just come back, and I stay here. Okay. All right. So, yeah, let's go back. Or I would say, yeah, <laughs> in one way, just yeah, let's just be in the body. And um, so, if there is again any kind of. Um, questioning, resistance, or um, um, awkwardness in the mind, then, uh, then just realize that um, it's part of what might happen in your practice in, in your life. So if your mind is kind of got used to a particular structure, like how a session should go, then, uh, oh, again, you know, we are going back. We already had the Q&A, and now we should go to something else, you know, like something else, whatever it is, like just something else more interesting and exciting. And then you can realize that, as you can do it now with me, or yeah, just in, in your the rhythm of your own breathing. And again, you don't need to change the, the rhythm of your breathing. Like I'm doing now, you can just be present in your body, and then we can continue to look, each, look at each other, or you can close your eyes, we can stay here. And we are not waiting for anything else to happen. We are just in the body, practicing to embrace this awkwardness of the mind, that it wants something to happen. And it's fine, you know, like a healthy mind would want something to happen because that's where the mind is thrilled to do something. <laughs> yeah, just yesterday we had a conversation, like how I am a fixer. You know, if there is something to fix, I will fix it. It's quite awkward when there is nothing to fix. <laughs> and I'm just content with being in the body, being here and now, focusing on body sensations, From the mind's point of view, this is just utterly useless, boring. And there should something, you know, be happening. It just can't be that, you know, this is all there is. Just, really? Come on, give me something, you know, like, <laughs> please. Please. <laughs> yeah. This technique is so life changing. Well, thank you. It is really, really good. Thank you. Thank you My pleasure, you know. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me tearful I'll because. Say it again. Yeah, you should say it again. You should have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not speaking. Mm -hmm. One, two. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Dan, you're a Don. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, life-changing for me. Hmm. Um, it really is. To just be in control uh, and know what's going on within. Um, so yeah, it's just phenomenal. So thank you very much. I j another thing I'm going to take away from this weekend that is absolutely life-changing. You're welcome. Mm. Thank you so much. Brilliant. I, yeah, I can't deny that. It just really makes me tearful when I think of like, if whole humanity would know this, 
<coughs> you really don't have to be spiritual for this. So if you're just, uh, you know, working for a company or you're just a mother and you have this human experience of being stuck in your head all the time and, and nervous and, and stressful and all that, then, I don't know, then just use it, you know, the, the way who how you can use it. Then it just, it, in then it just, it's nothing else. It's just helping to get out of your head. If you're some hardcore spiritual guy and, I don't know, you know, dwelling in the non-dualistic realm, then use it to get enlightened. Of course, you can't do anything like that, but yeah, why not giving a go? And I guess initially, like probably in, in the minds of, of many of you, there is this really this awkward feeling like, no, come on. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't tell me that this is like so simple. Especially if you have a brilliant mind or a bright mind, that you want something like, mm, to understand at least, just give me at least something, just a few ideas to understand better. But there isn't. I mean, I could talk about it, but like Laura knows that I can really talk, 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 but... I'd like to share something. Yes. Uh, you talked about how life we live in the UK, and to go to any uh, Western society, la, la. <coughs> I agree with you, Dan, when you say that uh, in this country, I'm mean, just saying this country, this Western society, we're so busy, right? As you said, we've got so much, too much stimulation. And I was been doing yoga at that time for about 10 years. And whenever we had to meditate, could I meditate? I used to sit there, what am I doing? I can't slow my mind, and I couldn't. Um, yes, you know, as you say, People take you to fairyland, you know, you're up in the clouds, you're flying, you know, all this. It didn't do anything for me. I could never find that my mind had actually slowed down. And then I went to India in an ashram for a month. And there, you know, everything's done for you. The food is done, you don't have to do anything. You, know, you wake up in the morning, you just have your shower and that's it. So there was nothing, I didn't have to worry about my kids, my husband, my business, nothing. And I could switch off. And after, when we had to do meditation in the morning, we had to do meditation in the evening. We had to, of course, they taught us techniques, and for a while it wasn't working. Uh, then I think on the third week, because you're in that space of quietness and stillness, and you're doing yoga, and everybody's loving, and everybody's kind, and all of a sudden it changed me. And then I decided to go on this, because it, this ashram is in a beautiful location. I sat on the mountain, on the hill, like, overlooking this beautiful view. I thought, I'm going to sit here by myself. I didn't expect to go into meditation, but I went into the meditation pose and everything. And after a while, I went to a beautiful, beautiful space. There was nothing. And I really still can't describe it. I didn't want to come back. And when I actually did come back, so I had to, you do come back somehow. I think sometimes you do need to be guided back because I've been to another meditation where somebody had to be guided back. It was a beautiful space. I came back to London. Did I get it? Mm -mm, nothing. I had to go back to India again, to another ashram. Again, for a month, escape from everything. I got mm. it. Thank you. So mm. I think we do need to find this space. And I think sometimes coming to the yoga retreat, mm. even if it's four days, being in this beautiful atmosphere, allow it, don't look for it. It'll find you. Mm. Don't look for it, because you keep searching or for this wonderful, glorious moment. Mm. It won't happen. Let it just come to you. Yep, thank you. And I guess I would, yeah, pick up on the last few words, that it's somehow, it's this human experience that sometimes it's just not black and white. And I, I can like wholeheartedly say at the same time that, like you said, don't look for it. And at the same time, I would say, look for it. So in one way, the beauty of this practice is that you can do something. You can do this simple thing, withdrawing your attention from the mind and being in the body. So this is something you can do. And at the same time, you can absolutely let go this whole thing of wanting to get anywhere. 
So I could tell you that this space is available like now, and now, and now. You don't need to go anywhere. But at the same time, it's also like part of the human existence that we have a, a busy mind. And actually, even though it sounds so nice that it's available now, which is true, but that's not the experience what we have. And it's just, yeah, it's just at the same time true that if you do this simple thing, it means that you renounce to all ideas of wanting to get anywhere or imagining that there is a better future or a space or anything. You almost like blindly just focus on one thing that I just am here and now and in the body and I don't care about anything else. If I experience bliss and spaciousness, hallelujah. If it's sadness, well, then it's sadness. And I just do this again and again and again. And I can't deny that, you know, the whole spaciousness or freedom, well, yeah, there is some kind of a flavor of it that is closer to joy than to utter sadness and dramas. But still, it's not happy all the time, you know. But, um, yeah, the more you disrupt thoughts, thoughts about wanting to get somewhere or even wanting to be happy, the easier it becomes just to drop into the body, breathe in and out, breathe in and out, breathe in and out, and then that's it. And next time when you get distracted, you just do it again, and again, and again. So the worst thing that, that can happen is that um, you're stuck in your head and you learn something that can help you to be more in your body. The best thing that is just to, I don't know, become liberated or whatever you want to call it. I guess we have four or five minutes, so if there's any other question or feedback that we can we can do them and then yeah just a sec and then also we can just sit we can just sit in quiet I often I teach Lomi Lomi and then quite often we're waiting for someone to come back from break and then there is like maybe 30 seconds or one and a half minutes and I just do the same thing like I'm doing here I just tell people oh this is a wonderful moment just to breathe in and out be in the body and just to let go of this idea that we're waiting for someone because it will be very annoying we're waiting for someone <laughs> no it's a thought we just drop it we just breathe in the body and then the person will show up and then we'll continue yes Sorry, can you get the mic for the, the lady or yeah, or if you can speak up? Let's try. Mm. I, I was just thinking that we often bring in in the NHS kind of mindfulness practice and what I usually hear from adolescents, I'm not doing that. That's it. I don't like that. I don't do that. Mm. I might color in, but I won't do any meditation. I won't do any mindfulness. Mm. They're really re resistant, I think, because being in the mind is quite frightening for them, um, especially when you've got a mind that is quite negative. Mm. But what I really like about what you're what you're proposing is, I feel like I could bring that in to some of the clinical work that I do, and just say, just 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 breathe, just be, just breathe through your nose. Just what's your nose doing? Yeah. What your nose doing? And um, I think what I try to do is is try to help them to understand you have a thought and let's create some space between the thought and action. Especially maybe around <coughs> behaviours that are harmful. What's the space between the two? So if we can create a little bit of distance between the two, and I think this is a wonderful practice that right. I'll, I'll be taking back. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And please do. And um, I mean, it will sound stupid, actually. And I'm, I'm not quoting myself. I'm reading it from the book I wrote, but it's from Viktor Frankl. Many of you probably know, beautiful therapist. And he's got this really famous um, quote, which just relates almost literally to what he said. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And that's, that's what this is about. To create this space so that I wouldn't be in the reactive mind, I would have just a tiny bit of time and then I can connect to what's happening and do something. But it's, it's not coming from the autopilot. So we got two minutes left and the last thing I would say that I just would encourage you, and by the way, anybody use this. I mean, it's not trademarked or anywhere. We are just human beings breathing in and out and we can be in the body. But sometimes I really, really wish that this would just spread like a good virus. And I often, you know, have these 
um, Ukrainian and Russian soldiers in my mind, and I really had dreams, like how I wish they could do this. Maybe they are sitting in a fucking tank and shooting someone two minutes later, but in that two minutes, while they're not, they could just be in their body and withdraw the attention from the mind, just to have like a tiny bit of fresh air, just a tiny bit of sh fresh air, you know, the, in that painful, challenging situation. Because you can do this anywhere and any time. And yeah, so NHS, I often think of that, like I, so much I wish, you know, like they would learn something like this, which is just so simple. I mean, I, I often talk to people in, in festivals on cocaine, they are, and I just, you know, they, they say, tell me about like how busy their mind, and of course, you know, like on drugs, well, it is in that state, and with all the stimulation and the music, and then they don't know how to go to sleep. And I tell them, well, you know, I might have this idea, but this man, I say, oh, no, 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 you know, like I can't meditate, it's just so stupid, and I can And I say, okay, just give me 30 seconds. And then I tell them this whole thing, I can really say it in 30 seconds, and they're like, oh, fuck, this is amazing, I'm gonna do it, I'm going back to, the, to, the, to my tent, and as I lie there, I will do it. And then the next day they come there to say, like, you know, for the first time in their life they did something they kind of was so dummy safe that they could do it. So, yeah, I think that we are coming to the end. But we are not coming to the end of breathing in and out and being in the body. So just please enjoy life continuing to be present in your body. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>